It's re it started. It's recording in the cloud. Okay, good deal. Um, all right, so um, I want to welcome all of you all on behalf of the Deep Dixie Contest Club. My name is Larry Anderson, NN50, and uh, it's with great pleasure that we have members here from these groups that we know of, the Dallas-Fort Worth Contest Group, uh, the 599 DX Association, they have two, uh, I should say we have two logos. I didn't know which one to put up, so I put both of them. The Tennessee Contest Group, we have several members here from Tennessee. The Area 51 Radio Group is located here in Tupelo, Mississippi, birthplace of Elvis. And then the, the absolutely awesome CW Ops Organization. So thank you all for coming, and we welcome you here with open arms. Uh, especially to the members of the Deep Dixie Club, uh, just a few announcements. Remember that, the, unless I'm mistaken, that this weekend is the uh, Work All Europe CW contest, and that was so much fun because of the uh, QTC, the traffic handling, that, that'll be fun. I know there are a lot of other contests, but these kind of focused ones. Uh, next weekend on the 15th is the North American CUSO Party Single Sideband. And for those of you who do the phone, um, we, we still need some team members on our Team Elvis, which is the first team to be formed. We don't have very many people who work sideband uh, in the club, or at least who have time to get off and be on that. We're also already building teams for the CW Open. And last year, the Deep Dixie Contest Club scored number one in the in the CW Open. Our, uh, team Elvis was the number one team, and our Team Magnolia came in seventh place. And uh, then the third team was Team, I don't know, I believe it was Team Cotton. I think I was on that team by myself. But anyway, uh, <laughs> that's September 5th. So just to let you know that anybody who's not associated with the club or who wants to be on the team, let me know and, uh, and, and, and let me know if you can do 160 because that's that's going to be a, a room for a lot of mulch that those of us who can't get on 160 can't get. Um, I asked for ideas for more of these Zoom meeting presentations, and uh, K0WA sent me three or four ideas, but I've had about five or six uh, requests for a particular topic that that I mistakenly associated with Tor's presentation when I said CW skimmers. And he's not going to talk about skimmers, I don't believe. But we've had several people who want to have a, a deep dive into CW skimmers. And I know that even today, uh, Dr. Lopez, um, HC6ZM, uh, has questions about that. So just to let you know. So uh, if you, after this is over, if you want to go to YouTube and watch this or pass the information around, just go to YouTube and do a search for the Deep Dixie Contest Club, and uh, we, we hadn't had our videos up there very long, so uh, just, you're welcome to that. So, um, at this time, I'm going to stop sharing and, and say, thank goodness, we're so happy to have Dr. Uh, Tor Clay, and I'm going to let you introduce yourself, Dr. Clay, but if you don't do a significantly uh, good job in telling the truth, all the facts about <clears throat> yourself, I'll pitch in. So go ahead, Tor. Okay, uh, let me start here. Okay. 96 people what? with us. Okay, can you, uh, can you see that? Yes, sir. Okay, so first of all, the picture in the background is great. I, I found it one year uh, driving across Texas in the middle of nowhere. So I just had to, had to get that. Uh, so I'm going to talk about pan adapters and unassisted contesting, mostly for CW, but I, maybe you could get this to work with, um, with, with, with sideband. Uh, and so I'm in for OGW and a little of my history. I was first licensed in 1986 as in for OGW still same call. And this is going to be about some contest software. So I started out first contest in 87 with just paper logging. Uh, I think I actually 
<clears throat> did get a a double RL dupe sheet in the mail. I think I never used it. Uh, then I moved on to CT and NA, and then TR log for a long time. And then I'll talk about I developed my own program. That's what I use now. It's called SO2 SDR for single op to uh, software defined radios. And there's the uh, website for it. So how did this get started for me? Well, it was it is related to CW Skimmer. So in, that came out in 2008, you uh, probably remember. And I built my own receiver, uh, SoftRock uh, SGR receiver. First time I tried surface mount soldering and the thing worked and the thing is wow. So you get all these, of course, all these signals. And of course this what got put in the fairly fast in the assisted mode, I wanted to operate unassisted. Uh, it has a blind mode built into it, but it didn't interface uh, with any logging software at the, at the time. And I wanted to do other things. So I ended up decided I had to make my own. So that's, that's what I did. And I'll tell you a little bit about how I've been operating for the last 10 years. Uh, first of all, if you're gonna have a pan adapter, there's a choice. Do you want it horizontal or vertical? I stole this picture on the left from Kevin's pre presentation. It's a horizontal picture. I greatly prefer the vertical over here, like see the uh, original CW skimmer. Uh, one thing I saw obvious, you can put the call sign next to the signal. And over here, I can't really tell which call goes to which signal without taking several minutes to figure it out. Uh, another thing, it's with just a, a, a X uh, horizontal display of peaks that you don't really see the history of the signal. You can't tell if it's CW. Whereas if you lay it out horizontally and it moves fast enough, you can see, you know, right away. And sometimes you can even read the CW off the screen, which is kind of neat. Um, at one point in my station, I actually didn't have enough vertical resolution. So I took a monitor, a cheap uh, monitor, and then turned it sideways. That gave me a huge uh, vertical display. Uh, so I'm going to use a vertical, you know, for, talk about vertical displays. And the first thing that happens is once you, you know, turn into, tune into a, a, a big pileup, uh, like this one, I think this was FT5ZM, uh, you see you're kind of overloaded with information, right? So what does a pan after give you? It gives you a huge amount of just information. So what, what can you do? Well, you can computer process it, right? So you can, this is CW Skimmer, right? So you can go in and uh, decode the, the signals and, and process it and then to just spit out a list of call signs and then you don't really actually need to look at it very much. And I like a quote from N4 uh, ZR's um, NCJ article is that you want to, don't want to look at it otherwise you'll be distracted. And that's, that's kind of true in a way, right? Uh, well, I do something different. Um, is instead of, if you're not going to computer process it, you're not going to be assisted, you have to figure out some way to organize it. And what I do is I organize, I organize it visually. And one, okay, so you can start out, right? Yeah, you would put a call sign next to each signal, but that's not really using all the information which is here, right? So there's a whole lot of information. Just putting a call sign doesn't really, you know, do much. So I'm gonna talk about what more you can do. And <clears throat> first of all, so talking about unassisted, uh, operating and specifically going to talk about search and pout. So what the problem is, is pretty simple. You've got to identify as many signals on the band and that means you're going to have to tune them in and, you know, identify them uh, by ear. And the question is, how do you do this more efficiently? Well, you know, to do that, you would want to one, avoid any stations you've already worked, right? You don't want to listen to them over and over and over. So, you know, you would want to, completely avoid tuning your radio to them because you're just wasting your time hearing the same guy you for you know you already worked an hour ago so what you'd like to do is to only tune to a station which are more likely to be new and a lot of what i'm going to talk about is in this talk is when you're unassisted you, you know you don't have a list of, of calls so we're going to do things that are more likely or more probable but they're not absolutely certain um, so what I came up with is a pretty simple visual algorithm to do this. And I find that, you know, being visual 
is also useful because you can do something which is visual in parallel with something you're doing auditory, you know, like working stations on other radio. So what I'm going to talk about really does it doesn't necessarily have to be used for two radio contesting, but you know, it works fine for one radio. But if you want to do it with two radios, it makes it easier because you're doing something which is, you know, visual on one radio and, and audio on the other. Uh, you know, sometimes you hear, you hear about people watching TV while they're contesting in a slow, in a slow, a slow time. So here's a here's a, the kind of the problem. This is something I thought about when I was coming up with this problem: is is how do you deal with all these signals? Well, it's kind of like this: you're looking for a needle in a haystack, or actually, you're looking for hay in a haystack. So, you know, when you look at this. These pictures are not actually the same. I actually added one nail on the right-hand side. The question is, can you find it easily? Well, you know, probably you could if you spend it if you spent 10 minutes looking. Uh, but yeah, there's actually one extra nail which is placed in the right-hand picture. And this is again thinking about the band adapter, all those signals there. Okay, right. There's just a whole mess of, mess of information. Well, yeah, you can, okay, I'll give you a hint. What you can do, it becomes very easy if you made the one extra nail a different color. Very simple. Then, okay, that takes all of one second to find it. Now, if you go back here, you can see, okay, yeah, yeah it's actually right, right about there. I, I, do you see my mouse cursor moving when I do this? Okay, good. So that's the key thing is if you make the actual signals different colors, they can stand out. Right, and that's makes it makes finding a you know hay in a haystack very simple. If it's if it's a one one hay, it's a different one straw is a different color. Okay, so that's that's kind of the, what I, what I was thinking about originally when I when I came up with this algorithm is how do you how do you visually sort something? Well, you have to color code it is one way. So uh, how does this work? So when you're okay in the, in a contest, one thing that's that's true almost always, except that one case is not, it's a CW sprint. But in most contests, uh, stations will stay on fixed frequencies for some amount of time. That time varies, okay? Could, you know, if it's a shorter contest, NAQP, you know, people might only stay there for five, 10 minutes and then go somewhere else. If it's a big DX contest or sweepstakes, they might actually stay around for half an hour, 45 minutes. And it's also true that modern radios are really amazingly stable in frequency. Um, so, you know, maybe not, they're not absolute accurate, but they'll stay there for within a, you know, a few uh, less, you know, a few Hertz or, or tens of Hertz for, for a long time. Now, what does the pan adapter give you? It gives you all the frequency of, of all the signals. So how can we use that? So for example, if you know, if you know, say 1210 Zulu, you, you a station is calling CQ exactly on 1402532. 15 minutes later, you come back and you know you don't necessarily decode the signal. You know, listen long enough, but you you notice that there's someone calling CQ on CQ on exactly that same frequency. Well, it's probably the same station, right? Uh, if even if he stopped and someone else started. They would probably be a little bit off. Now it's possible some people, you know, move their VFO a little bit. So this doesn't always work. But again, we're talking about probabilities. We, you know, if you see someone a, a signal on the same on the same exactly the same frequency with some within some tolerance, it's probably the same station. So, you know, we we shouldn't bother wasting time even tuning in and identifying that same station, right? We already know it's it we probably who it is. So the idea is very simple. Like the nails, what I'm going to do is change the color of the signal you've already worked at a specific frequency. Now, it's important here that I'm not just changing a list, the color in the call sign. The actual signal is what you have to change, the actual color. And once you do that, if someone new comes on, you know, it's a different frequency, if you haven't colored that one in, it's going to show up immediately. It's going to look like, look like that, right? So that's the basic idea. Uh, as you work stations, you're going to color code them on the on the pan adapter, and then new stations come on are going to you know show up right away. 
Um, so this is an example. Uh, I forget what year this is from. This is several years back. This was the, uh, I believe that, yeah, this is the Stu Perry contest. Uh, if you look at the CW long enough, you can actually see SP. So here's an SP down here. Uh, and you can see people sending grid squares. And what I've done here, this was after I've been going around working a bunch of stations. And the stations I've worked are marked pink. And uh, if I can move, let's see. Okay, and then I've actually typed in their call sign. So I identified these calls. This was not CW Skimmer doing it. I actually tuned all of these and typed in the call sign, worked them, and now they're a dupe. And you can see what it does. It changes those color, those, all those signal colors to pink. Now, stations I haven't worked uh, show up as white. So I can go around, click on signals, I work them, and if I see a white signal pop up, that someone probably knew. Now, yeah, it could be someone else who decide I'm gonna, I'm gonna move to a different frequency and that happens. But again, we're looking at things which are more probable. It's, if we wanna look for a new, a new guy to work, it's probably gonna be this one here. And you can see there's some others down here that are weak, one around here, uh, another one up here, and so on. Uh, another thing I wanna point out is you'll see some call signs here which have no signal next to them. Okay, so the way this works, uh, if you mark the color and there's no signal there, it doesn't show up. So it only marks signals which are above the noise, right? So this guy here, he must have left or gone somewhere else. Uh, doesn't matter, his signal's gone, so I don't have to worry about it. Okay, so you can get more, I get more actually from looking at the actual pan adapter than looking at the calls. Uh, I don't have it in this picture, but sometimes, you know, to save time, you know, you're tuning by someone and you've worked them, or, you know, a long time ago, you can actually in the program press a key and it'll just mark it as dupe without putting in their call sign. Um, another thing you can do, a, a key parameter, uh, you can choose, you set a time limit for how long these stay marked. And so, you know, you can set it for 10 minutes, 15 minutes, whatever you like. Uh, depending on the contest, you want to adjust that. So again, if it's a contest where people stay around a long time, you make it longer. Uh, if it's a more a shorter contest, you make that time cut off shorter. And as the time runs out, this, these will get unmarked. Uh, sometimes you will see, I, unfortunately this is not the best picture, you'll see sometimes a uh, pink mark which is slightly off. And that might be a good a possibility where there's someone else has moved in. So again, you might want to check that out. It could be just someone adjusting their frequency um, a little bit. So, but this is, this is a basic idea. Uh, another thing when you're doing, I'm doing this is I don't have to go in order, right? I can go, I can hop around however I want. Um, there's these little dots here, okay? So the little dots are similar to what N1MM does. These are actually a peak detecting of the signal. So that just detects where there's a, a signal present. You notice it also picks up, it picks up noise as well as signal. So this little band of noise, I think caused that dot there. And I can either click on, you know, somewhere here, just go to that frequency, or I could also click on the dots. I could also use the keyboard and hop between dots. Okay, so there's several ways you can uh, get around here. And the red line is just where I'm actually, that's where the, the, the radio is actually tuned to. Okay, so uh, let's see, let me, okay, I think that's all I had to say there. How does this work? Well, I've been doing this for about 10 years now. So uh, it's about the 10th, 10th anniversary and <clears throat> pretty much operate this way all the time for CW contests. Uh, again, except one, one exception, this doesn't work for the CW Sprint because obviously there you, the stations stay around for all of about 10 seconds. So you can't tag them by frequency. So CW Sprint, this is, doesn't apply to. Uh, it really depends on how big the contest is. For big DX contests, it can be a little overwhelming to try and tag the, the entire band. Although sometimes I will do part of it. Uh, it's still useful to hop around. If you're doing a single band operation, it's more useful because there you're really trying to get everybody 
you can. Also, it's very useful in DX contests when the band first opens, right? So there's fewer signals or, or closes. So there's fewer signals uh, or, you know, for example, in IARU contests open briefly to Europe, uh, you know, 10 meters and, you, you know, it's very easy to go in and see all the stations that were there to work. Sweepstakes, this is great. I really like it. Um, obviously there, CW sweepstakes, there's not many, enough people to work. So it's on Sunday, it's really painful to find someone. Uh, you can find them really fast this way. Um, and if anything, if, you know, it gives you something to do just to keep on marking signals, trying to, you know, turn the whole screen pink. Uh, medium sized contest, it does very well. It's better, uh, you know, state QSO parties, the NAQP, things like this. Uh, where there's not as many signals and you know people move around a lot. Uh, it's very good, uh, particularly NAQP where most count bands. Uh, but it's it's been quite useful I've, I've found over the last 10 years. I've basically used it for all my CW operating, which has been mostly unassisted. Again, some other comments. Um, I think I, I, as I mentioned earlier, it's easier, I find this easier to do if you're running two radios because I can, pick out the next radio, the next station on the second radio, I'm going to try and work search and pounce without actually listening to audio. Okay, so it, it makes this a little bit easier uh, to do two things at once. Um, there's a lot more strategy you can put into this uh, with the pan adapter, and this is not necessarily my program, but you can do this with any, any pan adapter. Uh, you can decide, you know, if you're doing S search and pout, you can decide who you're going to work, right? So if you want to go for high rate, you can look for loud signals, fast CW, very easy if you've got the, you know, the vertically oriented where you can read the CW. Uh, I can pick out fast, fast guys, loud signals, no problem. If you want to look for multipliers, often those are weaker signals, you know, like if you're uh, going to, in the IRU, IR, I, IARU contest this summer, you know, when you go to uh, 40 or 80 the first time, you're trying to work the HQ stations and they're all pretty weak and they all, you know, pretty much you go to weeks, a week's uh, signal, it's gonna be a new malt. Uh, you can also see pileups right away. You know, in sweepstakes on Sunday, someone gets on, you get a pileup, I can see that right away. Um, another trick I do sometimes, if you have two antennas, you can switch between quickly with an antenna switch, you can see some signal suddenly get stronger. And one way, you know, for example, just an example, if you're in a DX contest later in the afternoon, you want to pick up molts from South America, you know, I can point one antenna down that way. And if I switch back and forth, suddenly a bunch of signals get really loud. And I can, you can see that on the screen. And I know those are going to be probably all from South America. I can just go right to them without uh, you know, skipping over the other, other you know, stateside signals. Uh, some other things which are built into my particular pan adapter, some of these and many in other programs too now, uh, as I mentioned, it peak detects signals. So it doesn't do CW coding. It's just looking for where there's a local maximum in the signal versus frequency. And it puts a little dot there, and then you can actually tune between those with the mouse or keyboard. Uh, so that's a very useful feature. One thing I really, I really enjoy is it can, can automatically find an open frequency to call CQ on. That's, that's really neat because it saves a lot of time. Uh, basically, all it does, it, it, it gets the little dots. It finds the biggest gap between them and puts you there. Uh, if that, the only thing I find, it gets often confused by key clicks. So it'll find a light, nice large gap next to someone who's clicking. Uh, the way you get around that is simply mark a, that frequency is busy. And then you can, you know, it'll go to the next best uh, hole. So that's, that's been a very big help to, to, you know, find an open frequency in a busy, busy band. And as I mentioned also, you know, the, the way this works is, you know, you would type in a call sign to, to do a dupe check and then it would put it on the band, on the pan adapter. Um, you can also just press a key, you know, if, if you're tuning by a guy you've worked 
you know, the, the day before and you, you, you hear him over and over and over, you don't need, need to bother putting this call sign, you just press a key that marks with his dupe and puts the pink line up there. So uh, that can save some time also. Uh, actually, let's see, I'm getting towards the end of the, okay, so a few more slides here and I can take questions. So again, I've been doing this for 10 years. Uh, I released this program in 2010. Uh, Eric NO3M has helped a lot, in particular, he added a lot to the program for in terms of two radio stuffs, and also N0NB helps a little bit. Uh, here's the website, and it runs in Linux, so it's just a little different. Uh, and this is simply because I have a very different computer background for most people. Uh, I've worked in Unix and Linux for in my work life for the last 25 years, so that was simply the easiest way for me to do this. I didn't, you know, didn't want to take the time to learn. Uh, learn Windows programming, so uh, it runs in Linux. Uh, it is written in what's called the Qt uh, toolkit, so it means it could potentially be made to run in Windows uh, if someone wants to try doing some programming. It is open source, so you know you can contribute and 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 uh, add things to it. Again, that's how I got NO3M interested in adding stuff. Uh, because I operated with TR log for years, I basically made the interface and the keys, the key presses, very similar to TR log. So if you've used that, it's going to feel very similar um, to, to the uh, TR log. It's one, one nice thing about making your own contesting programs, you can do whatever you want with it. Uh, so again, I made it like TR log, so I like that. It does have some, some limitations. So it's basically single op only. It doesn't have, the, it doesn't support multi-multi, any, any kind of network. Uh, contest net, network of stations. Uh, it's limited contest support. I don't have a lot of time to put into this, so mostly the contest I operate. Uh, it doesn't do much for assisted operating because, again, I don't operate much assisted. Uh, it can collect connect to the clusters, however. Uh, I should say the clusters, there's one unfortunate fact, which is the, the frequency resolution on spots is not high enough to do the kind of marking I, I, I use. Unfortunately, that, that, was, that choice was made back in the 1980s in packet cluster. It really needs to be have another decimal place. Um, it also doesn't really support RTTY. It does support uh, some digital modes in VHF context. I operate those. So it's, again, it's a little bit more limited, uh, but it's, it's slowly ex including uh, running, you know, I'm slowly adding more stuff to it. Recently, I added the capability to do uh, SO2R with two keyboards, for example. So, uh, okay, I think this is my last slide, actually. This is what my typical setup looks like in a contest. It's really very simple. Uh, another design of this program is it doesn't have a lot of different windows. I don't know how, if you can all can see this well, but this is the main logging window. There's one entry for, again, it looks a little bit like TR log. Uh, there's one entry box for one, the one radio, one for another radio. Uh, a summary of your you know, QSOs and MULTs, uh, the last few uh, QSOs here. Uh, MULTs that you need, okay, so they're color coded. This was an NAQP, so uh, the red are the ones that you still need. And then I've got the two band maps open, so radio one, radio two. Uh, this is not during contest, so there's not much going on here. You can see not many signals, but this is, you know, what it looks like. So I really spend most, I want most of my time looking at the actual band maps uh, to look look for new signals. And then I've got, these are all my antennas. Uh, this is a homemade antenna selector, uh, which basically selects all my uh, antennas. Uh, there's a few more windows this has, which are not open right now. Uh, can do, you know, if you have a Telnet connection, it can, there's a separate window for that. Uh, if you're running WSJTX, it will, in a VHF contest, it will, that window will actually do some useful things like sorting the, you know, the decodes. And there's actually a uh, visual dupe sheet for the people who do that, like I do during the sprint. So that's actually the end of what I've got here. Uh, and I guess I can uh, take any questions that people have. Yeah, there are, there are several questions, and I encourage you all, if you want to, uh, 
Chris, your space bar and ask Tor. Let, let me start off with a question from Kurt, K4RO, that uh, he yep. asked in the, in the chat. <clears throat> and that is, which Linux distro and desktop GUI do you prefer? Uh, I use I use Gen 2, uh, and this is GNOME. But I've used several in the past. I've used Gen 2 now for more than 10 years, and that's kind of what I'm, you know. I, I, but this will this will run on basically any any modern Linux distribution. So it, you don't really need any particular distribution to to do this. Okay. I uh, go ahead with your question. Hi, it's Bob N6 TV. I got a series of uh, five uh, yes or no type questions if we can go through them quick. Yeah. First, thanks for all the uh, yeah, go print, ahead. thanks for all the uh, print QSOs over the year. Uh, which SDR hardware are you using here? Yeah, I should have said that. So I'm using uh, a what's uh, it's called the Ephedri uh, SDR, and it's an First of all, the, the program right now supports two two kinds. It supports the sound card driven, you know, IQ type SDRs. It also support supports network SDRs. I think these are original. The protocol was originally come coming from SDR IQ, and the Ephedri SDR I have it runs over the network. And I like it particularly because it's a dual receiver. So I have one box which will do the, both radios. And this is running also, I guess I, you know, I didn't say much about the hardware, but this is running off the IF frequency of the, of the K3s. So the K3 is your transmitter. Um, can you zoom in uh, if the band gets crowded uh, to increase the resolution? Yes, yeah. So this is actually, uh, well, actually, no. Right now there's two zoom levels and this is actually, zoomed in there's a zoom out from this picture right right here uh this is actually a 4k monitor so it's actually quite large in real life okay seems like you could zoom in a little more and when things are crowded you know everybody's half a kc apart. yeah i mean that's something yeah, I, I i could probably you know i could do but basically i found that this resolution it's it's close enough i don't need to get any any closer than this it's uh even when the band gets busy i don't have a problem putting calls you know call signs next to it. Okay, uh, just real quick, um, you find it slowing you down, having like in a sweepstakes going up and down a fresh band that's open and just entering call after call you've already worked and instead of just tuning by them? Uh, again, if, if, if I know I've worked the, 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 the station and, you know, I don't necessarily enter the call, I would just press a button and it marks it as a dupe. So, um, it does it slow me down? Yeah, I don't know. Um, I don't think it does too much. I mean, because to get the benefit of you know finding new stations, you've got to you've got to mark them. Uh, and in something like the sweepstakes, at least people seem to stay in a one frequency for a fairly long time on Sunday. So you don't have to spend too much time going back and remarking them. Okay. Yeah. If you, if you just have, don't have to type the call each time, that's great. Just two more quick questions. Um, you're doing CW keying with uh, on-off DTR type keying, uh, parallel port, old parallel port, or uh, win key? It's a win, win key. Okay. Uh, it, yeah, Linux, again, it's a, it, it doesn't do too well with uh, on-off, you know, the parallel port keying. So, yeah, this is, it uses win key. Okay, and finally, um, have you tried to do peak detection on sideband, or what's the problem there? I've actually not tried, uh, but this that would be an interesting problem. Uh, I don't know. I, yeah, I'm not sure how well my algorithm will work. For one thing, there's, you know, if you think about it, kind of less frequency slots in the sideband contest. So in the, C, in the CW contest, you know, there's lots of obviously more signals. In the sideband contest, you, you're much more limited. Uh, I really haven't tried. In fact, the, the 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 marking technique doesn't really work and it's it's not set up to work for a sideband contest you know i've got something i've got to do is to it's got of course it's got to mark a wider bandwidth right now the, the program doesn't even do that uh, but yeah so i really don't know how well it would work in turn for a sideband contest that's a seems to be an unresolved problem but it should be doable we can do it visually it seems like a, yeah i think it's do it doable too. um 
I mean, yeah, you, I, I, it's, I've used it enough. I, I can tune in signals on sideband. You just have to kind of be aware, you know, you click if whether you're in lower sideband or upper sideband, where you click on the display. Uh, otherwise, you end up, you know, the wrong side. But uh, other than that, I haven't really done enough serious sideband contesting to see, you know, if this, this tagging technique really works there. Thanks very much, Doric. Good job on the program. Yeah, yeah good, good, good to talk to you. And uh, I have a question that's come in, uh, and not from text message. And that yeah. is, uh, what what do you do? What is your occupation? What do you do when you're not on the radio? Okay, so I'm a physics professor at Mississippi State University, uh, MSU here, and I my particular area is computational physics. So. I solve problems on supercomputers. Uh, so I write a lot of computer code, but I should say I'm, I'm, I don't in my work write, uh, you know, graphical user interfaces. So that's something I, you know, knew. Uh, but yeah, I, I write, I, I do numerical calculations and, you know, I'm a physics professor. Okay, I, I know we have more questions, so uh, somebody chime in. We had from had one from the uh, chat um, from Scott Wright. He says, "Tor, any plans to link this to AI-assisted analysis so you can match fading or improving signal strength with prioritization for working the molts?" To do, I don't exactly. To to, to say that again. Um. Any plans to link this to AI assisted analysis so you can match fading or improving signal strength with prioritization for working the molts? I don't know if, if Scott's still with us. Yeah, no, I, I haven't I, I haven't thought about anything like that. No. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. Yeah, there's more you can do, I guess. Um, I mean, I haven't done really any kind of processing of signals you know if, if you in fact if you look I don't even do uh, I don't even do the click removal you can see you know key clicks here so I really uh, yeah don't do any kind of fancy signal processing other than just kind of throwing the signals up on the screen and then you know dealing with that graphically but yeah there's there's a lot that can be done uh, yeah it's on a whole other level I think that's all we have from chat at the moment. Okay, uh, earlier <clears throat> someone asked about uh, how this would impact someone who is colorblind. I mean, is it possible to, to change those colors? Or sure, yeah, that's... the colors are changeable. Um, yeah, so it's actually not, I, I mean, I don't have a menu item that would change it, but it'd be, it's very simple to call, you know, change the colors. but. Uh, yeah, I haven't thought about that, but I don't know what would be the best color for someone who's colorblind, but that, uh, I'm sure you could figure out a color that would be acceptable. I, I mean, I just chose, I guess the, the pink is, I guess, magenta. I just chose it because to me it, it stands out, but there's nothing particularly special about that color. Got another question in chat. Uh, how far does the signal have to move before it is considered a new one? Don't stations calling off frequency show up as a potential new station to work? Right. So, there. Okay. So there's two things there. If you let me go back to this other picture. Um, if I don't know if there. Yeah. I guess you can't see any any examples here. Yeah. If if these if these are so these are on the station calling CQ. And if someone comes back to them, yes, you will see that signal often slightly off, and that'll, then we'll, that will appear white. Um, as far as the dots, there's a, a little bit of a delay before the, you know, the, the peak detection assumes it's a new signal. So usually uh, that's not a problem. Well, you, you do see here, you know, I don't know if you can see it, there's two dots here. Probably that was someone who was answering him, and actually you could see a little bit of a white signal there. Uh, usually I don't find that to be a problem uh, because the person who's calling CQ tends to stay at the same frequency and you'll see, yeah, you do see some stuff around them. Uh, 
but yeah so they sometimes that can be a problem but in it generally it's not not too bad okay more questions anyone yeah here's another example up there i believe somebody was slightly off Yeah, and where the key clips are, is that where the magenta looks like it's growing hair? Exactly, right. So the key clicks are, yeah, you see a little spike at the beginning and the end of every element. And, you know, CW Skimmer is a way to take these out. I've never, I haven't gotten around, bothered, or I haven't been able to write something which works as well. So I just leave them in. Uh, but yeah, th those, are, those are the key clicks. Uh, and some are, obviously, some are worse than others. Uh, these are actually fairly clean signals in this picture. I don't know if the other one, well, those are fairly clean too. But yeah, sometimes those those do get a little bit annoying, but uh, that's something that certainly could be improved. Okay, let's see. Uh, Frank asked, how about split stations? Uh, I mean, this doesn't really know anything about split stations. You know, normally in a contest, oh, well, I, I use it for, yeah, just for DXing, sure. I mean, that's, uh, in a contest, you know, if you find a split station, that's really pretty unusual. Uh, I do use it just for like DX pileups. This was, you know, this was F, uh, me trying to work FT5ZM on, you know, on, on 15. And again, yeah, you can often in a pileup, just as you would CW skimmer, figure out where the guy, you know, coming back to the DX station is. Um, this doesn't decode the call sign, so, but it's a similar similar idea. Okay, was that someone with a question? I got a question. Okay, David, go ahead. What's the resolution of that? Uh, spectrum picture on the right. It's uh, a good question. Um, uh, you mean in term in terms of uh, the vertical kilohertz? scale? Vertical scale. So these are kilohertz. This is you know twenty one oh twenty four down here. This is twenty one oh forty four. Uh, in the in the last picture. This is actually zoomed in. So the pan adapter actually covers 100 kilohertz in this case. I could, I could change it. This is zoomed in by a factor of two, so I could zoom out. Right now, this is covering about, what, 23 kilohertz. I can zoom out, and it covers uh, twice that, so 40, 40 or 50. That gives you some, some, uh, some idea. This is actually a picture of a 4K monitor. So. Uh, it's actually, you know, this is a, actually quite big in real life. It's a little hard to see here. Well, let me ask you a question. Would you ever have the, uh, the difference in low frequency to high frequency shown on that chart there? Would it be far enough away that if you saw a white line show up, let's say at the extreme ends that it would be far enough away that you might have to retune or is your everything you have is in resonance so well that you don't have to retune when you move from one end of the band to the other the only case it might not maybe maybe it would be on 160. um 160 i have a shunt fed vertical i think it you know there it might i might have to retune the amp if i went off from one end to the other uh, most other cases, I don't think I need to. Okay, and um, let's see, uh, Jeff, K-A-1-I-O-R, you, uh, you want to uh, ask your question or make your comment that you put in the chat? Uh, Jeff, yeah, if you're I muted, can. you can just press your space bar. Go ahead and ask or make your comment. I just want to share an observation that as a station who's directly on the East Coast, uh, I'll be searching and pouncing and trying to work a weak 
European station on 80 or 160. And I've noticed several times that people have obviously discovered that they can use me to find the DX. And they try and skate in and call the DX before I've even made the QSO myself. I find it a little um, unethical or however you want to put it. Yeah. Yeah, I guess, yeah, that would be a little unethical. Um, I don't know. And if in Mississippi, yeah, working Europe from on the low bands is tough in the contest, at least, you know, I've operated from a bunch of states and it's a big difference. Okay, the uh, floodgates are open from anybody else who has a question. Go ahead and speak up. Just press your space bar. Tor, can you uh, uh, describe your station? Okay, uh, yeah, I didn't include that here. Um, so I have two towers up. One is 100 foot, one is 70 foot. Uh, and it's set up, I've got uh, a monobanders on 20, 15, and 10. So this is actually how I control everything. It's a homemade uh, controlling system. So I have an upper antenna, which is, oh, sorry, lower antenna, which is fixed on Europe or, or the Northeast. I operate a lot of domestic contests, so that's useful there too. That's so the lower antenna for both 10, 15, 20, 15, and 10 is, are, are all fixed Northeast. The upper antenna rotates. So on 10 meters, it's a two four element Yagi. So, uh, um, 66 over 40 feet, uh, 15, it's two six elements, 70 over 35, and 20, it's uh, two four elements, 100, uh, 100 feet over 50. Uh, 40 meters, I have a uh, two element linear loaded, which is on the same boom as the 20 at 100 feet. Uh, dipoles in a tree, uh, the wire beam, it's a moxon rectangle also hanging in trees. Um, 80, I've got a dipole up and I've got a, a four square, which is I've got wire elements around one of the towers. Uh, and that's what actually this is, uh, I made this display, this controls the four square. I just click on where I want to go, it points it. And then for 160, I shunt feed the tower and that's not shown here, but it switches it automatically. And I've got a, a, a receiving array for 160 and 80, which I control here. I just click, because this is a, hexagonal array, so it has six directions. So I just click where I want to go and it, and it, it will uh, switch there. Uh, the only other controls I have, uh, of course, besides the radios, I've got rotators, which are uh, uh, manual, you know. And this is on uh, uh, four acres. So I'm, you know, close to running out of room for antennas. It, will this uh, software work on a flex radio? I don't know. It's a big question. I, I don't have a flex. Uh, I don't know exactly what format format you know if it can, if it can be used or not. It'd be an interesting qu thing to try. I just don't know. I believe uh, the underlying uh, operating system on the flex radios is Windows, unless they've changed it. Yeah, but that shouldn't matter as long as, you know, they have, you know, I could probably make it work as long as they, you know, have details about the protocol, which, you know, you talk to the radio with. I don't think it matters what's inside the radio. I mean, I, the radios I use are, are K3s. I have two K3s. Uh, again, the Ephedri SDR runs off the IF. So this works quite well with the Elecraft because that, that's what I've used, right? So, uh, you know, for example, if you've used a K3 with a pan adapter, you probably know or aware that the, if you change filters, the IF frequency shifts. So I put in a correction for that. When you, if you change the filters, it, this corrects for that. So you don't have to, you know, worry about that, that shift when you change uh, CW filters. But it'd be, it'd be very interesting to try with the flex. I just don't know if, how it work. Hey, Dora, this is Ralph. Hey. I haven't heard you for, 
for a while. Actually, I've, I've heard you on the air quite a bit, actually. But what's up? Um, do you um, have bandpass filters? Because obviously, to get this to work so well, you don't have a lot of interstation interference. I wondered if you had bandpass filters or if one radio is kind of dedicated to 10, 15, and 20, and how you handle some of that switching. Uh, so I do have bandpass filters. They're the uh, ICE 419s, which are not great, but they work. Uh, and then, so the, the switching is handled by the Elecraft has a band decoder. I think it's the KRC2. I have two of those. That automatically changes the bandpass filters, and then it goes to a six six by two switch, uh, which is uh, from KK1L. That's all done automatically. And then after that switch, I've got some additional coax stubs on, on some bands. Uh, it works pretty well. I have a, a the worst interference is on between 20 and 40. And that's actually something in, inside my house, which I haven't figured out. Uh, somehow, when my house gets excited on 40, it generates a bad 20 meter harmonic. So I haven't figured that out yet. Uh, the only thing I could do is point the, tw the 40 meter antenna or 20 away from the house. Um, but other bands are, it, are fairly good as far as being able to hear on two bands. Okay, thank you. That's, uh, yeah, it's pretty interesting how you, you handle that because that, that's one of the, the biggest constraints we have is trying to get interference away from your station because I think you yeah. show screens, you know, and you, you see yourself. Well, this picture I'm not transmitting. Yeah, there's some there's some pictures. Yeah, if if I, when I was transmitting, on in the worst case on 40 and 20, it looked terrible. Um, one thing I do in the program is when it transmits, it turns off the peak detection, so that doesn't screw up, you know, the the, the little dot placement. It basically it turns that off. It listens to the wind key. When the wind key says it's transmitting, it turns that off. So that doesn't at least doesn't screw up uh, the peak detection part. But yeah, I, I do have problems, particularly 40 and 20, which is uh, not, a, not a, a, a pretty bad place to have it. But something in my house, I just haven't figured out what it is. Thank you. Ralph, Ralph he hasn't figured out what it is because he's too busy winning contests. Okay, let's see. Ed, uh, W2LCQ, I, I, you had a you had a question or comment a while ago. Did you get that in? Uh, no, no, I didn't, uh, Larry. But uh, but thanks a lot for calling on me. This is Ed up in New York. Uh, uh, that tour was a terrific presentation. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, I, I'm an avid contester in sort of uh, in, intermediate level, I guess maybe not even. But uh, I'm running uh, 7300 and uh, a very compromised small antenna up in Manhattan here. Um, I keep my eye on the band map. I'm running a N1MM plus. I keep my eye on the band map and the um, uh, available MULS windows. But unfortunately, a lot of times um, uh, I can't hear most of the stations that are displayed there. So I'm spending most of my time searching and pouncing, uh, turning the dial and clicking on the um, uh, display uh, window, uh, the spectrum display window. Um, but what happens is I, I'm, I'm calling two, I've got to wait, call two, three, four times before I can get answered, before the pileup diminishes. Um, in terms of strategy, S&P strategy, is that a waste of time? Should I just call once and go on or, or what, what would you suggest? Uh, it's hard to say. I mean, it depends on the contest. You know, if it's a, if it's a contest where there aren't many mul multi in the multipliers, then yeah, you probably do need to work that station. Um, if you're, you know, running two radios, then you can still be doing something on the other radio calling CQ. If you're running one radio, then yeah, at some point probably you should move on. Um, my, my next step, you've answered my, my next question, which is I'm going to, I'm going to put my hands on a K4, uh, when, when I can, uh, maybe, uh, later this year or early next year. Um, that's the next step. I can't add power. Uh, because of TVI around, uh, I live in an apartment here in the city. I can't add power, so I'm, I'm, rest I'm restricted really to the 100 watts. But um, uh, my other question, the last question is, uh, the, the N1MM plus spectrum display, uh, can the colors be changed uh, on, on those signals? 
I know? have no idea. I don't think so, but uh, not not like this at least. Um, I, yeah, it's I, a lot. Yeah, if you it, running, yeah, 100 watts, it's a lot easier for for two radios. Yeah, certainly. Um, yeah, because what I do now is I I, I uh, S and P all over the place, uh, and then when the uh, when the, when it dies down, when when it sort of uh, quiets down a little bit, then then I run. Um, but uh, that, that's been my strategy. Okay, great. Uh, thanks so much, Tor. I really appreciate your comments. Yeah, sure. And we have something interesting in the uh, in the chat. I think the Tor you'll be able to address directly. Let me open that chat window and read it. What if I can? Is there a way I can see the chat window? Yeah, yeah, you should. At the down on the bottom where you see share screen, chat, participant security. Uh, do, you, do you see that across the bottom of the screen? Uh, it's on the top for me, but. Oh, okay. Um... And there should be, or maybe in the, there's a an ellipse, three dots. It might be something so it shows chat. Yeah, all right. It says more. Mm hmm. Ah, there you we can, go. And if you want more screen space, ah, you can now I got it. Yeah, yeah. Screen. Okay. Oh, I got it now. Yeah, Larry, I should have opened this before. It would help. Larry, you need to tell Tor and to get this to work with a flex. Someone send me a flex. I can do it. But I'm sure. It, no, I'm sure it's possible. I think they've they've published. Yeah, all I you know all we need is the API. How do you get the spectrum out of it? I mean, that's it. It must be possible. Tor, have you been able to see what uh, what Gary put in the chat window there yet? Uh, that... At the end, yeah. Yeah. I wish I could take it for a test drive. And well, you it's, it's out there, it. yeah. And uh, Gary, if you're still tuned in, if you missed that, then if you want to watch the recording of this, then one of the screens that Tor had in his presentation shows the URL for, uh, I guess, for, for downloading. You'd have to have uh, Linux. Yes, you would. Device. Yeah. Yeah, I was going to try and put it on live on with, with the radio here, but I, I, I couldn't get Zoom working on the other computer. So uh, it's not, this is not the computer I use for the radio. Hey, man, we, we'll take what we can have. This is wonderful. We'll take it. Okay, let's see. They are, any more? Well, let's see. Okay, here's a from from Mac. In, in, uh, versus okay. assisted. Uh, yeah, of course, this is unassisted. So uh, it's different. I mean, you've still got to find all the stations yourself. So this, you know, you, you've still got to do a lot of work to find its find station. So yeah, it's, it's not, um, you know, it's just different than assisted. Uh, so it, it does take a lot of work you know, to do a lot of tuning on other bands. So, uh, however, but I think this is a way to do it a little bit more efficiently. That's that's the whole point is to try, you know, make you, it, it won't tell you where it's a new station, but it, it, it's a way to make it more probable that you're finding some, something new. Uh, machine requirements, it should, shouldn't should take a lot. Again, I wrote this, I started using this 10 years ago. Um, I do, I mean, I do have an eight core machine I use now, but I don't think you need that much power. Raspberry Pi, I, I have not tried it, but um, it it should work. I don't, it, yeah, you just have to try it. I don't know if it would run two, two band maps at the same time, but uh, I think it should, you know, it, it's possible. Well, Tor, what's the practicality of someone who is just a SO1R? Just using it, just unassisted, just you know, normal. Not well. The, the, you know, the practicality. You know, again, it's the it's the 
the visual S and P is not a SO2R thing. It's just a, a way to do search and pounce, right? So you don't need two radios to do that. Um, the practicality is that, you know, it, you can tune faster, you know, to new signal and hopefully get, you know, new signals, see, see when new signals show up. You know, in fact, sometimes I, in, it's, in some cases, I, I actually don't run two radios. You know, one example, the IRU, IARU contest when 80 meters was open to Europe, I could barely make any contacts. <laughs> but those, the ones I did were really important. So I was doing one radio trying to make work as many of the HQ stations, you know, because there's so much noise and they could barely, barely hear me. So it, you know, it works equally well for one, one radio or two radio. It's really the same idea. Okay, well, uh, let's see. Uh, I'm going to give a chance for one more question or, or comment, and uh, I'll stand by just a moment to see if anybody has anything they want to throw in for the good of the cause. Excellent presentation. Thanks. Yes, sir. Thank you, Ed. I appreciate that. Okay, <clears throat> folks, um, we really appreciate all of you coming. It, it means a great deal to us to have so many uh, uh, great ham radio operators coming and trying to share what we have with one another. And the D Dixie Club will continue to have some more of these. So uh, we'll try to see about putting the information in the channels where you would get that in the future. And uh, look forward to something that maybe your club is doing or you're doing on your own presentations so that we all can share with one another and learn and enhance things. We may not always, always agree on everything. It's that's okay. As long as you agree with me, that's all that matters. So anyway, and thank you a lot, Tor. It's been a great, it's uh, very informative. And it's one of those things I'll have to go back through and uh, read again, and watch again. And uh, we just, we appreciate uh, having you in our midst and and your uh, willingness to share with us. Okay, yeah, thanks for asking me. Uh, now you you know a little bit of how I how I operate. Uh, so anyway. Okay, folks. Well, well again, thanks a bunch, and uh, I believe we'll stop the recording in just a minute. Want to make sure, Jim, that we uh, save the that chat window so that we can share that with. Uh, the other deep dixie members who want to see what comments and questions were asked there so okay, good we'll night to all of you a good morning to those of you who are from europe and uh i'll check mr rasha do you have anything else before we quit no sir thanks very much tor that was awesome Okay, well, we're going to shut her down and uh, good night, everyone, and uh, we look forward to catching up with you on the next one.